Hello and welcome to the CureLogs Technology and Cureton Repair webinar block two. My name is Dominic Lussek. I'm a PhD chemist and the CEO and founder of Credentis, the company that has developed the CureLogs Technology and Cureton products. In this part, I will talk to you about the underlying technology, how it works, how it was developed and how in the dental office you can detect remineralization changes due to cured on repair. As a disclaimer, I would like to mention that when I say cured on repair in the presentation, I also refer to cured on repair fluoride plus, which is the US version of cured on repair, which has been enhanced by adding fluoride. When I talk about caries, what I mean is the progressive disease known as tooth decay. When I talk about initial caries, I talk about the non-cavitated caries lesions, which is normally regarded as an ICDAS 1 to 3. And when I talk about a cavity, I mean a cavitated caries lesion, so ICDAS 4 to 6. Biomimetic approach for real caries therapy. In the US, this is called uh, guided enamel remineralization. In Europe, very often the term guided enamel regeneration is used in conjunction with curedon repair. Why biomimetic? Because the CureLox matrix, the self-assembling peptides that form those fibers and then go on to form the biomatrix, have two characteristics which are to a certain degree similar to what the enamel matrix has. It has a very high affinity to tooth mineral, so namely hydroxyapatite. And the advantage which is unique to Curalox is that there is a possibility to modulate the matrix activity, meaning that in, the, um, in certain formulations, uh, it works on the surface, but the, the CureLox could, can also be applied so that it diffuses into the subsurface lesion of the carriers and there forms the matrix and attracts calcium and phosphate to the subsurface lesion body. So that is where actually the early carriers starts. How does this work? So the uh, self-assembling peptide technology itself has been first described by Agali et al. in a Nature paper in 97. This is, was the first time that short peptides were used to form supramolecular arrangement. In this case, those fibers that uh, can be seen in the second slide from the left. In the very left slide, you can see how the monomers, the peptides itself, form first a tape, then a ribbon, then a fibril, and then a fiber. So there is a hierarchical self-assembly leading to what you can see in the second, second picture from the left. If that matrix or those fibers are then placed into, for example, an artificial saliva, calcium phosphate is deposited around those fibers. And that is what can be seen in the third picture. If you then zoom in and look what uh, those calcium phosphate deposits look like, you can see the hydroxyapatite typical needle-shaped crystals which tangically, tangically align onto the fibers. So the fiber would be running through the middle of those fan-type structures. Important to note here is also that the biomimetic mineralization with P11.4 does not form prisms, but forms fan-type arrangements of structures. So what is the main difference that is caused by curedon repair than, for example, fluoride? Fluoride mainly, due to its high affinity, it mainly acts on the very surface layer of the enamel. So that is about the top 25 micrometers. There has been experiments done where people have measured surface micro hardness, but not only in the surface, but also with relation to the depth of the lesion. So in this table, 
you can see on the very last column the depth of the lesion starting at 25 micrometers below the surface of the uh, enamel. And then you can see whether there has been an increase in micro hardness or whether it has not been. The green numbers all show significantly increases of micro hardness after two weeks in a remineralization solution, showing that P114 or CureLox leads to increase in mineralization down to 200 micrometers of lesion depth. And the lesion itself, in this case, was about finished at around 250 micrometers. So the two, 335, you can see for the very low, uh, the 275 micrometers or the 300 micrometers depth, that is the natural hardness of enamel. You can also see that if you go to the middle column for fluoride, that there is no significant increase compared to the control or to the, uh, non, to the demineralized lesion already 25 micrometers below the surface. So how does this work? The application of Curedon Repair or Curedon Repair Fluoride Plus the way that those products are formulated is that the self-assembling peptide P114 is formulated in a monomeric form. So if you have the carrier's lesion, there is a subsurface lesion body, which is depicted in white in the very left picture. There is a hypomineralized surface layer depicted in blue which, if the carriers is active, has pores. In the second picture, you can then see the drop of monomeric P114 being applied to the surface of the tooth. The P114 diffuses into the subsurface lesions and starts to form larger fibers, as you can see in the third picture. Those fibers are actually too large to then leave the subsurface lesion again, so they are kind of trapped within that lesion body. In the course of the next three to six months, the fibers attract calcium and phosphate from saliva and start to form new hydroxyapatite crystals within the lesion body. That mechanism of action has actually been proposed already by Jen Kirken back in 2007 and has been shown to be correct in experiments recently published either clinically or more mechanistically in vitro experiments. So by regenerating the enamel tissue, we can now really try to work to a more therapeutic approach than a restorative approach to preserving enamel. So the top idea here is always to try to preserve the natural enamel structure as much as possible or until a point when a restorative intervention cannot be avoided anymore. How does the dentist actually detect those early carriers lesions? And there are a number of carriers detection devices or techniques that are used in the practice out there. Most commonly, probably still the, the radiograph. You can see here in the pictures labeled A and B from a publication by Schley et al, where you can see the early carrier's lesion in A, the shadow, the borders indicated by three dark arrows. And one year later, you can still see a slight, a slight shadow in the enamel uh, of that teeth, but it has clearly regressed and the uh, enamel lesion has remineralized to a large extent. So this is probably the most common way of detecting early carriers. Unfortunately, in order to monitor the regression and to monitor the success of the guided enamel remineralization, x-rays can only be recorded from time to time normally every six or every 12 months is more common. And therefore, 
to have a closer monitoring, x-rays are not suitable. Yet, x-rays is something that is present in every uh, dental practice. So it is most important that the changes induced by on repair can really be monitored by an x-ray. By a study that has been done a few years ago by Professor Jablonski Momini from Marburg, uh, she tested both the diagnodent and the Vista proof. Both of those are carriage detection devices available for clinical practice. Diagnodent probably being the more commonly found in general dental practices. Both of them work on the basis of fluorescence, meaning there is a laser sent into the enamel and a signal um, detected that is sent back from the enamel. Diagnodent giving you a number, whereas Vista proof gives you a picture which you then have to interpret more yourself. So let me walk you through this table a little bit. So Professor uh, Jablonski Momeni started with inducing artificial carriers lesions into healthy enamel. And so she induced those until Diagnodent and VistaProof gave her positive values indicating an early carriers, so an enamel lesion. Then at the time point one, which is after one week, T2 is after two weeks and T3 is after four weeks. She then measured those samples again, looking at how many of those samples now indicate healthy enamel and how many still indicate an enamel lesion. And you can see if you go through the first line, the test group, Already at T1, 21 out of the 30 lesions were regarded as healthy. And at the end, at T3, 28 were regarded as healthy and two were regarded as enamel lesions. The control groups, which were practically non-treatments, had at T3 still eight of them, eight out of 10 indicating enamel lesions and two out of 10 indicating sound enamel. Very similar values for the experiment with uh, Vista proof, just that slightly more of the control groups indicated healthy enamel or sound enamel for uh, the control group than did for the diagnodent. Nevertheless, at T2 and T3, uh, the differences between the test group and the control groups were always statistically significantly different. The third carriers detection mechanism that was investigated was the canary system, which is so-called PTR loom. There is probably the more sophisticated carriers detection mechanism out there at the moment. It detects overall four signal. One is a light signal. The second one is a uh, is a heat signal and the phases of those two signals. It all combines it together into the canary number, which is a number from zero to 100. And you can see in the picture in the middle that healthy enamel is regarded until about a canary number of 20. Then you go on to early decay and at around 70, you then have advanced decay, which clearly needs restorative intervention. The groups here are actually three. There is a negative control, meaning that, and these were natural lesions. The teeth with the natural lesions were placed into artificial saliva. The second group was the cured on repair group, which first was cleaned with a sodium hypochloride 1%, uh, acid etched and then cured on repair was applied. That is the standard application protocol for cured on repair. Also, a third group was included, which is a so called placebo or sham group, where the surface was cleaned the same way as for the cured on repair group, meaning with sodium hypochlorite and acid etching, but no cured on repair was applied onto the surface of the tooth. 
because here extracted teeth with early carriers were used, it gave the possibility to have an internal positive control. So on the picture on the right, you can see the green circles, which is where healthy enamel values were recorded. And then you have the white spots, so the early carriers lesions, B and C, where the carrier uh, signal was detected. And this was done for all three groups. So generally every group has a value somewhere around 15, which corresponds to the healthy or the sound enamel, and a value starting between 40 and 50 on the canary number scale, which indicates carious enamel. You can see in the triangles, which is the untreated, the circles, which is the treated one, and the squares, which are placebo controls. The only line that significantly changes over this 50-day remineralization experiment is the treated carious enamel. So the enamel that showed carious and was treated with cured on repair. Thank you very much for listening. If you're looking for any of the literature that was mentioned on the slides, please go to the Credentis website where you will find all the references in more detail. Thank you again for taking your time and listening to our webinar.